All right, you guys, this episode of Paradigm Profiles is called Salinas Valley State Prison. So this story right here is about Salinas Valley State Prison and all the incidents and updates that you guys have heard about at one time or another. Information has come by way of several different YouTube channels, filters that were intercepted, and most important of all, from Northaniels who were there and decided to walk away. As I told you guys, I personally noticed that within the last three to four months, there has been at least five or six different Northaniels who decided to lay it down after they were there at this prison. They walked away because of the things they were seeing and because things apparently got so bad that they decided that they no longer wanted to be a part of this crumbling movement. And make no mistake about it, these weren't just your average Northaniels. These individuals were all part of the leadership circles that were established out there on these yards. These guys were all delegated positions within this household because they obviously illustrated some form of leadership stature. So they were in the know for a reason. And again, these guys were part of the leadership. Now the other thing that's interesting about some of these guys that have walked away is that they all at some point have reached out to a YouTube channel for the purpose of facilitating a message about the treachery, the ill agendas, and the aimless direction leadership has been moving in. And like I said yesterday, I'm sure there's gonna be those individuals who aren't gonna like this information and who will say whatever they can to dismiss it. But nobody can say that this is poison that's being spewed by dropouts with a foul agenda or anything remotely close to those lines. And I say that because one has to consider the source. These guys didn't get removed. They weren't in trouble and they didn't have an ulterior motive that simply led to them leaving the yard. They simply left because they were discouraged and they seen what was really happening out there. The other thing I find interesting is that these guys have all reached out to different YouTube channels because they felt like they needed to use these channels to put out a message to the masses. Everybody has taken notice of the YouTube phenomena or the YouTube craze insofar as those who have created platforms to put out the gospel to the masses. They're not only watching and paying attention, but on some level, they've even started to use their own social media platforms as sounding boards themselves to facilitate their own messages. That's crazy when you really think about it, but that's where we're at today. And as they say, advancement demands change. Now, before I get into the crux of this video, I wanna make somewhat of a disclaimer, or at the very least, make it very clear that I'm not adding anything to this. I'm not spinning any narratives and I don't have a personal stake in this. I'm simply conveying the information to you exactly how I got it. The last thing I'm gonna say before I get into this is that you guys have heard about several incidents that have taken place in Salinas Valley from a combination of different channels. The individual who provided this information made it very clear that for the most part about 70% of that information has been accurate and correct which obviously means that about 30% of it has been inaccurate. And this is not about fact checking. I don't get into that. If some of the information I put out differs from what other YouTube channels have put out, then that's simply because there's different sources providing it. That's it, that's all. You guys as viewers have to make an intelligent decision about what you believe is accurate and what you believe is inaccurate. It's as simple as that. Now for the purpose of keeping the source anonymous, I'm gonna refer to him throughout this video as the source. He's smart enough to know that they're gonna do simple arithmetic and figure out that two plus two equals such and such, and he's okay with that. With that being said, let's get into it. So there's several yards in Salinas Valley, but the yard that this information is primarily about is B Yard. And the source who provided this information had been there since 2016. Ever since they opened up the shoe and released everybody back out to the general population main lines. As I've already indicated, the source that provided this information to me was an integral part of the functioning leadership. He worked directly with Gonel, Truco, and Silencio and made it very clear that it's not his true intention to cast these brothers in a negative light and slander them, but only to let people know what's really been going on on B-Yard. So in 2016, this source, along with a good handful of other Northaniels and Hermanos, all landed on B-Yard. According to him, they were deep out there, and there was a lot of carnalismo out there. There was a strong sense of unity, and everything was being ran the way it was supposed to be. 
His exact words were, it was a beautiful thing the way things were. The NF members that were there at that time were Horacio from Watsonville, Tapas from Greenfield, Gatos from Tulare County, and Conejo from Sacra. Later on, he said, Trino from DC or Delano ended up getting there. So not too long after arriving on B Yard, Conejo began to take steps towards establishing the yard. He established his COC, all his buffers, and then he handpicked his personal security detail. My source was delegated as Conejo's understudy. I won't say his second in command because it didn't sound like that. It sounded more like he was a right hand man slash mouthpiece. His responsibilities consisted of a variety of things. He had them all over the place. So this guy actually said some positive things about Conejo depending on how you look at it. He said the one thing that stood out to him about Conejo is that he had good foresight. He had a keen ability to see ahead into the future and that they made a lot of money out there on the yard. But all this came at the expense of the yard. For a long time, their only concern was to fill their pockets with money. And in the course of doing this, the yard's well-being became second on their list of priorities. There was a designated leadership that was tasked with overseeing the yard. But at that time, Conejo and my source only concentrated on finances. So sometime around 2018, 2019, under the directives of DC, David Cervantes, an audit was ordered from all the prisons that were functioning in the state of California. Something obviously prompted this audit, and that was the obvious, because a lot of money was coming up missing. So when the audit finally came back and all the different yards from all the different prisons submitted their final numbers. So when the audit finally came back and all the different yards from all the different prisons submitted their final numbers, it came back that B Yard and Salinas Valley had generated the most revenue but that they were second to last insofar as money that was actually on the books. In other words, they were broke and there was a lot of money missing. So according to the source, Conejo got his finance crew together and apparently advised them that they were going to focus exclusively on bringing the yard's coffers up and that they were going to run their own yard audit to figure out where all the money was going. To me, it sounded like a form of damage control and that there were too many hands that had access to personal expenditures. Not only that, but it sounds like they did a poor job at bookkeeping and that the powers that be were dipping into the money for their own personal gain. Conejo apparently advised his finance crew that they were going to start running dope on the yard for the yard and that in the interim, they weren't going to make any personal profits themselves, at least not until some of the missing money was replenished. So once they ran the yard audit, they basically found out that the ones who were responsible for managing the money on that yard, that money came up missing on their end. This was Styles from Modesto. The final tally came back as 18,000 had been missing out of the bank. How this was allowed to happen is beyond me. That's a lot of money, but there obviously was a lot of people sleepwalking out there too. So Styles was in charge of investments. Any investments that were made had to be cleared by him. And this also included keeping up the books, making sure everything was logged. It would have seemed like he would have learned this when he had his own bank account on the streets. <laughs> but what they apparently did was they invested in the key of heroin. At the time, there was five blocks that all made up the household and all five blocks agreed to throw in 4,500 to pay for the key. Since all this happened, two blocks shut down so now there's only three functioning blocks i don't know what happened but maybe they flipped them and turned them into s and y at any rate they drop 18k on a key and go through some homeboys from salinas to get it the money exchanges hands and they trust these guys to get it i'm not going to put the names of those from salinas who are allegedly involved in securing this key because i know them personally and i'm just not going to put them out there so these homeboys drive out to Delano and pick up the key, but long story short, the key never makes it back. <laughs> Allegations were made that this was a coordinated effort by at least two or three individuals to keep the key and basically burn these guys. So from that point, they got people looking for them on the streets. However it happened, the key never made it back and they took an $18,000 loss. Word gets back that the individual who was safekeeping it was scared and didn't want to talk to anybody. Which kind of tells me that something obviously happened to the dope and he's now avoiding that whole conversation. 
So those who were involved out there on the streets were given 48 hours to either come up with the money or produce the dope. So the 48 hours passes and neither the dope nor the money was returned. They weren't really in a position to recover it, so they end up chalking it up. So Conejo obviously feels like some of the responsibility fell back on him since it happened on his yard, since it was his proposed investment, and since it was NF money. So he pays the 18 bands back by giving up six cell phones. At the time, six cell phones were well over 18,000 as they were going for five to 6,000 each. So the phones go to Styles since he was in charge of finances and instead of cashing the phones out and returning the 4,500 that each block originally put in, he keeps the phones or does whatever he does with them. Bottom line, they were unaccounted for. This sounds like these guys either didn't fear any consequences or they just felt like the yard was so jacked up that it would never become an issue. Styles technically should have been relieved of his position initially when they first did the audit and discovered that there were some big discrepancies. But that didn't happen. Keep in mind that Styles was an NF member as well. So months later, all the blocks that had contributed to the key investment were asking about their money and wanted to be reimbursed. I don't know what type of arrangement Styles and Conejo had, but to me, this was suspect. When they conducted the audit and an investigation, they found out that Styles had basically pocketed the money and kept it for himself. So Conejo basically ended up giving Styles a pass. There was some confusion as to what the six cell phones were supposed to cover as Styles claimed that he assumed that this was payment for another key that was previously lost. <laughs> yeah, and I hate to say this, but I told you guys on multiple occasions that Northaniels were good when it came to losing paperwork either getting it intercepted or losing it, but that this was something that was a reoccurring problem. But I guess they also had priors at losing keys of dope and somehow trucking it off. So after the audit, they implemented a bunch of policy changes to basically avoid from losing any more money in the future. According to this guy, at the peak of their establishment, they were making about 25 bands a block each month. That's 125K a month. He said during COVID, it was about 60 bands a building each month. That's 300K. This is also when about 90% of the inmates on that yard hit on their EDD unemployment checks. So everybody had money. He said they had the numbers, the power, the routes, the product, the cell phones, etc., etc. He said they even had something arranged with the Africanos to where they were bringing in the Glavo through their visits and that they had the yard sold up. Nobody else could even get their foot in the market. And for whatever reason, the administration really didn't put that many MM members out there on that yard. The only two that came through since 2016 were Crow and Gabby. Crow only stayed about a year and really didn't get his end of the yard established. And Gabby apparently just stayed in his cell and shot dope all day. So at some point, Chuko hits BR from CR. He had been trying to get moved over there with Gonello, but it took months before it finally happened. So as soon as Chuko landed on B-Yard, he jumped right into the mix. He started searching for a line on some crystal, and for whatever reason, he wanted to go through Coco County. The Coco County line didn't end up panning out, so supposedly, one of the Nordaniels out there ended up plugging him in with the Paisa out of SoCal. This Paisa's numbers were supposed to be good, so Chuko jumped on it. I'm seriously almost embarrassed to tell you guys what happened next. Chuko goes through this paisa and lines up a legit driver with a legit car, but his driver makes the long drive back only to find out that the package is full of dog food. For real, how does something like that happen? This is common sense. I mean, what did this guy do? Just hand over the money, grab the bag, and cut tread? I would think that no matter how naive someone might be or how trusting, that they would still open it up and test it right there on the spot. Especially when you're picking up a package that big and when the money belongs to someone else. But they obviously don't do this and take another loss. Needless to say, the Northaniel that lined all this up had to pay for it since it was his connection. According to the source, Truco was a savvy individual when it came to his business practices and the one thing he didn't accept was any losses. The other thing he said about Chuko is that he had either a brother or a nephew on one of the other yards who had a pipeline for cell phones. 
He was getting anywhere from 50 to 60 cell phones sent in at a time, and this is where they were making a killing. It's safe to assume that if he had a plug that was sending in that many at a time, it had to be a CO. That's the only way you're going to get a boatload of cell phones in like that. So at that time, when he had a steady influx of cell phones coming in, they were going for six bands across the board. That was the going rate. But Chuko apparently believed in karma, and he believed that if he charged the North Daniels six bands for each cell phone, that bad karma would come back full circle. So he refused to charge six bands and said, we're not going to do that. If the homies want to buy a cell phone, we're going to give them the option to buy them at $2,500 apiece. But he was still crushing the market, capping it off at that price. If you do the math, 50 cell phones at $2,500 apiece is 125 bands. That's actually a smart move. Because when you drop the price, you speed up the market and give your clientele an incentive to buy. But this didn't seem to have an effect on Conejo's business practices because he also had a cell phone plug and he wasn't cutting no breaks. He charged six bands across the board. It didn't matter if you were a homeboy or not. So at around the time all this was happening, Silencio shows up. When he lands on the yard, they get him established with his security detail, his channels, and the rest of his crew. It's at this point that Conejo appoints the source that's providing this information to Silencio. My guess is that this was done to give Silencio someone who had been there for an extended period of time and someone who had experience with the internal workings of the yard. So according to the source, the responsibilities that Silencio delegated to him collide and are in conflict with leadership. Silencio's way of establishing his policies and protocols apparently differ with the policies and protocols that were already in place and this causes the source to start bumping heads with leadership on the yard. Essentially, what it all comes down to is cutthroat internal politics. Because the source makes money exclusively for Silencio, and the yard's leadership makes money exclusively for the yard. What ended up happening in a nutshell is this. Prior to Operation Quiet Storm, when Conejo, Chuco, and the former leadership were in place, everybody who was failing to fulfill their responsibilities as far as leadership goes were all relegated and relieved of their positions. This was triggered behind the findings of the audit. So after the indictment hit and Conejo and Chuco were transferred out, all the former delegates that were part of the old system got in Silencio's ear about how they had been unjustly demoted. At that point, Silencio decides to bring them back in and reappoint them, which is why everything went to shit and the reason the yard ceased to generate revenue. According to the source, it was no longer even about making money at that point. Silencio had been in the adjustment center in San Quentin for so long that he was completely out of touch with how manipulation works. These are not my words, they're the sources, but he says Silencio didn't know how to lead effectively or make choices because the others that he placed in positions were the ones basically running the yard. One of the examples that he gave was the situation that occurred with T-Money running into his cell for eight minutes. Instead of taking appropriate action against him, he was allowed to maintain his position and he didn't miss a beat. So Silencio ends up appointing Chino from Salas as the regimental commander of the entire prison. And it was under his leadership that they stopped generating revenue. The source said that these guys basically lacked the ability to make money. The other thing that he said that I thought was interesting is that you got all these YouTube channels saying that it's all about the money when it's not. It's all about each one of these guys' personal agendas. I understand his point, but I still think that at the end of the day, it's still about the money and that their personal agendas sometimes just superseded this. Because although they may have had personal agendas, it's still all premised on making money and maintaining the position of power. Because some of the examples of personal agendas that the source spoke of were Chino wanting to preserve his family visits at all costs, T Money only being concerned about making his personal profits and Silencio placing a lot of emphasis on continuing to get the drugs in. Now, I'm just going to say this. He made it very clear that he didn't want to cast a negative light on Silencio and that this was his guy. It's obvious that he held Silencio in high regard and that he took a personal liking to him. But unfortunately, this is his message and in order to get it out there, 
You can't have it both ways. So the source spoke about a filter that was circulated amongst the manpower that prohibited them from a number of things and stipulated directives in other areas. Needless to say, the majority of the manpower felt like this filter wasn't in their best interest or the yard's best interest and it put them all in a detrimental position. The filter basically advised the manpower that they were not to engage in any conflict with any other group segments for any reason whatsoever and that if a situation did arise that they were not to take matters in their own hands under any circumstances. Furthermore, it was specifically stipulated that they were not to respond if they were physically accosted, but instead to report it immediately for direction. In other words, it basically said that if they were advanced on physically, that they were not to engage and it made them feel like they would face serious consequences if they did. The general sentiment on the yard was that Chino from Salas, the one who circulated the filter, didn't want no smoke and that he was willing to go as far as selling out his own people. About a year after this filter was circulated, two incidents kicked off on the yard with the Africanos, and in both of these incidents, the Nortanos that were involved were assaulted and weren't allowed to defend themselves based on that filter. When it was reported, they were told that these incidents were isolated and that it was a dead issue. They basically were made to feel like they would face serious repercussions themselves if they took any steps towards retaliation. Again, the general sentiment felt amongst the Nortanos on the yard was that Chino didn't want to get into any conflicts because he didn't want to lose his family visits and that the rest of the leadership each had their own individual agendas for avoiding conflict at all costs. Whether it was not wanting to lose family visits, not wanting the chance losing the drugs coming in, not wanting to lose the personal revenue filling their pockets, or not wanting the chance losing all the luxuries they were getting on the yard. These were the agendas that prompted the filter. You guys will understand the far-reaching detrimental effects this had after we go into some of the incidents that took place on the yard. But at the end of the day, the dictates that were contained in this mandate had the Nortanios walking around with their heads down and everybody else on that yard, including the administration, looking at the Nortanios like they were a bunch of cowards. So a while back, you guys heard about an incident that took place in Salinas Valley between the Africanos and the Nortanos. According to the source who was there, the incident started when an Africano who was all spazzed out on meth went to go take a shower in B-section's lower shower. This shower was designated as a Norteño shower. Each group has their own designated showers. However, if a designated shower is not being used, the Nortanos and Africanos allow each other to use these showers. On the day of the incident, Silencio jumped in B-section's lower shower and apparently the Africano that was all spazzed out on meth also went to jump in the same shower. They basically got there at the same time. Silencio's security, a Norteño named Bubba from Modesto, got into an argument with this Africano and kind of just brushed him off. The Africano walked away, then doubled back and snaked Bubba when he was distracted. Bubba ended up getting knocked out cold for a few minutes. At the time of the incident, there was about eight Nortanos in the building's day room who would end up getting involved. When Bubba got knocked out, another Nortanio came to his aid after seeing he couldn't defend himself. This prompted another Africano to jump in and this guy had a banger. This is when Bubba was stabbed in the neck and head, but according to the source, the piece was a sorry piece and only ended up scratching him. On the other hand, there was approximately 30 Africanos who were also in the day room area who were out there during pill call. So it basically turned into a 30 on 8 and the Nortanos obviously came up on the short end of it. Two Sureños who seen what was going on came to the aid of the Nortanos and attempted to come to their assistance. One of the Sureños supposedly had a banger. And this is what was conveyed verbatim. There's been a lot of speculation, opinions, theories, and assumptions about how the shower door got shut and whether or not it closed, it didn't close, etc., etc. He said that when Bubba got knocked out, he did fall back into the shower door and that the door did shut and lock on Silencio. This has been confirmed not only by several Nortanos that were there, but also from looking at the video footage. I heard about some of the speculation that was being thrown out there about Silencio and how he was being portrayed as being a coward for possibly closing the door himself. 
At the time, I didn't render an opinion because I didn't drop nothing on this incident. I stayed away from it, but I will say this. I know Silencio personally, and I will say that when I heard this, it definitely didn't sound consistent with what I know of him. People might not care for him, and I'm sure there's people waiting for any opportunity they can use to assassinate his character, but I know for a fact that Silencio is not a coward. There's cameras that capture the entire incident from beginning to end, and whenever you get written up for a rule violation and the incident was documented on camera, they allow you to watch the footage during your investigative 115 hearing. This is also used to either establish your guilt or to vindicate you. Due to the fact that there was some question about how the door was closed, several Northanians who were involved in the melee watched the video and confirmed that it was closed as the result of Bubba falling back against it. They said the video was clear and that you could see these events as they unfolded. A lot of the Afghanos who were involved also watched the same video and used it as a basis to weed out all the cowards who were accused of closing their doors during the incident. All those that were identified as closing their doors were either DP'd or taken off the yard. The footage didn't show any Northanios closing their doors, and this was something that they looked at the footage for. However, what they did see was that an NF member by the name of T Money ran into his cell for 8 minutes. In the footage, he can be seen taking off his chain and changing his shoes, but everyone knows that it doesn't take 8 minutes. So following this incident, the majority of the Northanios on that yard were ready to get their run backs, and collectively, they agreed that this is what they wanted to do. The source claims that it was a good thing to see so many homeboys stand up and that they were strapping up ready to go. However, leadership sent out directives prohibiting any retaliation and furthermore advised all the Northanials on that yard that they would face serious consequences if they provoked or instigated any retaliatory action. The entire incident was called an isolated incident that was initiated by an individual who was high on drugs and therefore nothing further was going to be pursued. Again, the general sentiment amongst the Northanials on the yard was that they were being forced into a position that made them feel like cowards and that this was reinforced with a mandate that threatened serious repercussions if anyone acted on their own accord. It's at this point that the source really starts to get discouraged with leadership and what's going on. But here's the kicker, it gets better. A second filter was circulated that advised all the Northanials that if the Sureños decided to get their run backs for the two Sureños that were involved in the melee, that they were not to support them or get involved. This right here is just bad leadership and this should have been a no brainer. Keep in mind that the only reason that the two Sureños got involved in the first place were because they came to the assistance of the Northanials. And now they're being told not to back them up if they got off. <laughs> Needless to say, this angered a lot of the Northanials and created some tension on the yard. A lot of the Northanials that had personal relationships with some of the Sureños on the yard actually talked about this amongst themselves. And these Northanials had to tell these guys that they felt obligated to get their backs, but that they were being shortstopped by their leadership. Keep in mind that up until this point, the Sureños had already assisted the Northanials five times in this prison two times in the past on this yard alone and now they were being told that they weren't allowed to back up the Sureños. The source said we owed it to these guys to have their backs but leadership's agendas wouldn't allow it. They basically sold us out over their agendas and had the entire yard looking at us like we were cowards. Homeboys were literally hanging their heads. It was embarrassing. He went on to say that they could tell that the Sureños were trying to provoke the Africanos into kicking it off. But the sad thing about it is that the Sureños didn't know if it kicked off, we weren't going to jump. We were just hoping that nothing happened so that we could avoid the embarrassment of not getting their backs. So after this, an incident kicks off on Sea Yard where two Sureños hit a crib. The source indicated that B Yard knew it was going to go down and that they were just waiting for it to happen. Keep in mind that Sea Yard is under the same directives. When it did kick off, none of the Northanios got involved based on their directives. So the source says that Smiley from Pomona called him on his cell phone and said, What's up bro? Shit just kicked off over here and none of your homies jumped. That's some straight bitch shit. 
he said he had to explain again that the North Daniels wanted to assist, but that they were being told not to. Smiley tells him, your people hid under the stairs the entire time. The North Daniels on Sea Yard knew what was going to happen, but because they were under strict directives not to get involved, they stayed hidden under the stairs. This sounded crazy to me, so I pressed him for details and asked him, so you're telling me that the North Daniels in that building actually hid under the stairs while all this was going on? He said, facts, and they stayed there the entire time. Huh. That's a cold visual. According to him, two Sureños rushed into a crib cell and started hitting them. This was a coordinated hit, but apparently at some point, the crib breaks free and he gets out of the cell. When he comes out, he alerts the other Africanos as to what had just happened, and as a result, the Africanos kick it off. The building erupts, and when it's over, three Sureños had to be taken to an outside hospital, and the one crib who had got stabbed had to be taken out to the hospital. I obviously wasn't there, but I can tell you right now that these are the types of moves that could really threaten this agreement to end hostilities. This actually creates hostilities, and what's going on over there in Salinas Valley is dangerous. With regards to Operation Quiet Storm, I'm not sure if something was released or why this was being circulated, but they seem to think that gangster from Watsonville, Salvador Castro, cooperated and that he's been the CI from the onset. This is what he told me. I don't know nothing about this, and this is the first time I heard this name come up. Also, this is not gangster in the picture that you guys are looking at. Now, in regards to Baby Joker from Watsonville, he wanted to clarify rumors that were circulating with regard to how that situation unfolded. According to him, Baby Joker hit the yard and was perceived as a threat. That much I already knew. But Conejo knew that Baby Joker had the means and the motive to coordinate a move against the state-appointed leadership on behalf of the federal faction. Conejo knew this, and he also knew that BJ had the potential to elevate. According to the source, Baby Joker was watched extremely close as soon as he landed on the yard. This is something he confirmed to me himself. Whenever he would come around on the yard, Conejo's personal detail would pay extra close attention to his movements. Not only that, but he was not allowed to be alone with Conejo at any given time. So according to the source, Baby Joker concocted a plot to get rid of Conejo. And this was all coordinated through Demon. So Demon selected a Nortaño that was tasked with executing a hit on Conejo. The Nortaño was led to believe that he was in trouble and as a result, he was being put on frontline status. This was all supposed to be done under secrecy. So they tell him that as a form of cleanup, he was supposed to hit Conejo. Everything was set in place and their torpedo was ready to go. He's good to go, but what ends up happening is that they let this guy stew too long and he becomes antsy. He starts to get anxious stewing in his own thoughts because it seems like nothing is moving and nobody's really getting at him. So then he starts to become paranoid and wonders if this is really going to go down. It was supposed to be a coordinated hit, meaning that they were supposed to let him know when to take off. And they also had him under the impression that it was a sanctioned hit coming from the top. They should have kept him closer to the hip and the hit probably would have happened. They became susceptible to exposure by not keeping him closer and not putting a security blanket on this guy. But because they didn't, this guy ends up approaching Styles at some point and asks him if the hit was still going down. Obviously, Styles finds out about the plot, brings it to Conejo, and this exposes Demon and Baby Joker. The next day, Demon and Baby Joker both got hit. So this is basically the extent of his message. And again, when you guys take all these things into consideration, the one thing you need to keep in mind is that this is coming from someone who was part of leadership on that yard and that his whole reason for walking away is because he was discouraged behind the direction leadership was moving in. This wasn't somebody who was removed. He doesn't have an ulterior motive and he doesn't hate the homeboys. According to him, it's the complete opposite. He understands that his career is over and that he's now considered a target. And he's okay with that. Because when he walked away, he did so with a plan. His plan was not only to walk away, but that once he was gone, 
he'd reach out through a YouTube channel and put the message out there so that everybody will know what's going on on BR. In his mind, he's doing this for the homies that he left behind in Salinas Valley. He feels like they're victims of what's been going on and that somebody has to put it out there. Coming to grips with the realization that money has now become a priority for leadership and that the scope and breadth of the cause has changed from what it used to be is one thing. Coming to grips with the realization that each and every North Daniel from the bottom to the top is expendable is a reality that now comes with the territory. It's accepted and embraced for what it is. Due process and the privileges of being given the benefit of the doubt is something else that isn't always afforded. Unfortunately, a lot of good solid North Daniels had to find out about this the hard way. And yet, it's the North Daniels spirit and fire that's still ignited in the hearts and minds of those who continue to believe that there's still something righteous about this struggle to believe in that continues to keep a lot of these guys committed to stay in the course. And although some of these things collide and conflict with the belief systems that were created many years ago, they're still tolerable enough to accept. They're taught to take the bad with the good and the good with the bad. But allowing other group segments, regardless of who they are or what the reasoning is, to prey and victimize on North Daniels is going too far. How can anyone think that this won't discourage them to the point to where they start walking away? How can anyone expect them to accept playing the role of cowards for the sole purpose of placating the personal agendas of others? If this message doesn't encourage and resonate with some of those that are in positions to make some changes, then hopefully at some point it will with future messages that follow. Because there's no doubt that the source who conveyed this message doesn't stand alone. I'm sure there's going to be those who aren't going to like some of the things that were said, and that's okay because there's always going to be a difference in opinions, perspectives, and beliefs. Again, this isn't my message. I'm simply conveying to you someone else's experiences and the gospel they wanted to put out there. But I do understand and I can relate to some of this because these things, they're not foreign to me. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. I decided to do this video the old way we used to do our profiles based on the fact that this was somebody else's message and because I just didn't want anything to be misconstrued. We should have more content that we'll be releasing later, so tap back in for that. I have a Mexican Mafia video that I'm going to try to get out and then I'm also going to try to get out an inner demon, so tap back in with us later. With that being said, I want to thank everybody who's been supporting the channel, all our new subs and all of you who keep dropping positive comments. We appreciate you all and we place a lot of value in our viewers as it's you guys who deserve the credit for making this channel what it's become. Without you, we would cease to exist.